Red was her favorite color, even though her hair was a deep red and her cheeks most often a cherry red. Her mother tried to convince her to wear other colors, but red it was, even to the name her friends called her, Red. Her real name, truth to tell, was Millicent, but no one ever called her that, and neither shall we. Red was especially close to her grandmother, who lived a few miles away through a forest, lush and deep and dense. Granny was devoted to Red and, as old as she was, visited often. Granny delighted in bringing Red gifts she had made, mittens and slippers and sweaters to wear, cookies and muffins and puddings to eat. But of all these gifts, Red's favorite was the hooded cape of warm wool woven by her grandmother. Needless to say, the cape was as red as a blushing rose. One autumn day, Red's mother told her that Granny was ill, too weak to walk through the woods alone. I've readied a basket with bread and cakes for you to take to dear Granny, said her mother. Go there directly, don't stray from the path, and be home before dark. Well, Red was always in bed by dusk, so it never occurred to her to be by herself in the woods at night. She ran to get her hooded cape and returned to her mother. Remember what I've said, her mother went on. Straight to Granny's, no delay. And mind your manners while you're there. I will, Mother, Red replied. Her thoughts strayed to her ailing grandmother and to the woods she had never been through alone. Then off she went, wrapped in her red cape. On the bridge at the edge of town, she met the village woodsman. Where does the road take you, little Red? To Granny's with food to make her well. Take care you don't leave the path, he warned. Danger is lurking behind every leaf. Red nodded and smiled, staring ahead at the towering trees, but not really hearing the woodsman's warnings. Before he could continue, though, she was skipping along the path and into the woods. The woodsman watched her go and wished her well. Deeper into the woods, Red walked, marveling at the magnificent foliage and breathing in the cool, damp air that surrounded her. And always she stayed on the path. Rounding a bend, she came upon a sharp-looking fellow leaning against a tree. He fairly glowed with his silver fur coat and his dark, gleaming eyes. He was a wolf, and he had been watching her for some time. Now, Red had never met a wolf before, nor even heard of one. How handsome he is, Red thought, trying not to stare. The wolf looked her over with a steady gaze that tickled her and terrified her all at once. What a beautiful cape, purred the wolf. Blood red, my favorite shade, he smiled. And what a beautiful girl wearing it. Red blushed so deeply that it was hard to tell where she left off and her cape began. Have we met before? asked the wolf. I think not. I surely will remember such a savory rosebud, one with such delicious taste in clothes. The wolf smiled again. Red smiled back. Thank you, sir, she whispered and curtsied as her mother had taught her. What is in your basket? he inquired. Bread and cakes to make my granny well. Delicious, smiled the wolf. But what a long trip for such a tender tulip. 
Oh, no, Red protested. Granny's house is just past the cypress grove. The wolf could barely curb his appetite. He was tempted to wolf her down right there. But then he thought to himself, Why settle for a single course? Why not both? First, a bit of dried granny aged on the bone. And then, this apple dumpling for dessert. So he said aloud to her, You'd best hurry along then. Granny craves a crust of bread and, he hesitated, yearns for your yummy wildflowers. The color drained from Red's cheeks, though not from her cape. But I have no wildflowers. No what? choked the wolf. Red shook her head. He paused. Perhaps she'll be too tasteful to notice. A tear welled up in Red's eye. Now, now, my dumpling, there's no need for that, comforted the wolf. Look around you, wildflowers! Wildflowers everywhere, and, he confided, the farther from the path you go, the more succulent the buds. Oh, thank you, sir, Red said. Whatever succulent was, Granny would certainly like it. So off the path she stepped, plucking flower after flower, all the while straying farther into the woods. Farther from the path. The wolf ran straight to Granny's house and knocked on the door. Who is it? rasped Granny, unable to pull herself out of bed. Taking a deep breath and putting on his most innocent girlish voice, the wolf replied, It's great, Granny. I brought you luscious bread and cakes to make you well. D do you have a cold, my dear? asked Granny. You sound so hoarse. The wolf coughed delicately. <coughs> Will you let me in? he asked. Just lift the latch and, and let yourself in, my dear. Lift the latch he did, and in one bound he leapt on Granny, lapped her up, and licked his lips. The wolf had swallowed the sweet old lady in one greedy gulp. Ah, he sighed, sinking back on Granny's pillows. Then, with a plan he'd concocted as he was chatting with Red, he put on Granny's nightcap and went around closing the shutters. Just then, Red arrived outside, her arms overflowing with all manner of dazzling wildflowers. She was surprised to see the door open, but she peered inside the darkened house and called out softly, Granny, are you there? In reply, she heard a deep but delicate cough. <coughs> <coughs> oh, my, she thought. How sick Granny must be. Feeling frightened, Red approached the bed. Usually a visit to Granny made her happy, but she was uneasy. In the dim light, she saw Granny lying in bed, her nightcap pulled down over her face. How odd she looks, thought Red. The wolf coughed delicately again and pulled the covers up around his chin. <coughs> Why, Granny, said Red, what big arms you have. The better to hug you is, whispered the wolf. Stepping closer to the bed, Red noticed the wolf's ears peeking through Granny's nightcap. Why, Granny, said Red, what big ears you have. The better to hear you is, whispered the wolf. Still closer, Red saw a familiar but unsettling gleam in Granny's eyes. Why, Granny, 
What big eyes you have. The better to see you is, whispered the wolf. By now, Red was close enough to see the wolf's magnificent molars as he spoke. <gasps> Why, Granny, what big teeth you have. The better to eat you is, roared the wolf, and in one bound he leapt on Red, lapped her up, and licked his lips. He had swallowed the lovable little girl in one resounding gulp. Ah, he sighed, rubbing his swollen stomach and sinking back into Granny's pillows. In no time at all, he was sound asleep and snoring like a swarm of hornets. Just then, the village woodsman happened to be hiking by. He heard the dreadful droning sound from inside Granny's house and saw the open door. Remembering Red's visit, he rushed inside and found the slumbering wolf in Granny's nightclothes. Now the woodsman could tell a weak old woman from a wicked wolf, so he raised his axe over his head, intending to do away with this vicious outlaw in Granny garb. Suddenly, he noticed the wolf's distended stomach. It was twitching and twirling as though there was something inside, or someone. The woodsman put down his axe, took out his knife, and carefully slit open the wolf's stomach. As he did so, he saw the familiar red cape appear deep inside the wolf. He reached in and pulled Red out. Ugh! Sputtered Red. It's dark and slimy in there. The woodsman comforted her. You mustn't stop now, she cried. Granny's still in there. So the woodsman cut some more, and soon he pulled Granny out. She was alive. Red helped the woodsman gather several heavy stones, and he stuffed them into the wolf's stomach. When the wolf awoke, he tried to run away, but all he could manage was to drag himself out the door. Red stayed with Granny a few days and nursed her back to health. Then the woodsman, wearing his new silver fur coat, escorted Red back home. And she has never, to this day, wandered from the path again.
the thing about Goldilocks. She was extremely spoiled. Her parents pampered her like a Palm Beach poodle. They worked real hard to give her everything she wanted, but Goldilocks just never seemed satisfied. She was as headstrong as a moss-back mule. At breakfast one morning, her father gave her a toy rabbit that was as cute as a bug on a sow's ear. But Goldilocks just folded her arms and turned away. Bunnies are dumb. I don't want one, she huffed. And I don't want breakfast. I want another teddy bear. There were dozens of teddy bears in her toy chest, but her parents rushed off to get her a new one. While they were gone, Goldilocks snuck out of the house, dashed into the woods to hide, one of her favorite tricks. Meanwhile, just a hoot and a holler away, three bears were in their cottage contentedly cooking breakfast. There was a really big papa bear, and sort of a big mama bear, and a baby bear who wasn't big at all. Breakfast was a pot of porridge as thick as fresh churned butter. Now this porridge was hot enough to scald a skunk, so the three bears decided to take a walk and let it cool. Goldilocks, starting to feel hungry without breakfast, smelled the bear's porridge, and she was off like a jackrabbit in coyote country. Through the bear's windows, she spied the three steaming bowls of porridge. Now, Goldilocks never knew the meaning of polite, so without even knocking, she walked right in and straight up to the bear's breakfast table. First off, she grabbed a great spoonful of the porridge in the really big bowl. Yeah! She gasped, fanning her mouth. Any fool would know this is too hot to eat. So she picked up the middle spoon and tried the cooler porridge in the bowl that was soda big. Blah! She grimaced. Don't they have a spice rack? Then... She took a taste from the bowl that wasn't big at all. Why, this is just right. It was so good, in fact, that she left that bowl as empty as a pauper's pocket. Goldilocks, on the other hand, was full as a tick and needed a place to sit down. She spotted three chairs by the fireplace and climbed up onto the really big chair. Ash! She yelled, rubbing her backside. Haven't they heard of down cushions? She slid off the first chair and tried the middle one, which was sort of big, but not really that big. She sank into the cushion like a rock in a rain barrel. Ugh! She hollered, 
from inside the cushion. Who is their decorator? At last, she tried the chair that wasn't big at all. Why, this is just right. She smiled, leaning back in the little chair. Now, Goldilocks was way too big for that chair. Leaning back in it was like walloping a walnut with a sledgehammer. The chair splintered into a hundred little pieces. Oh, my, she protested. Someone should put that chair back together. There's never a handyman around when you need one. After all this exertion, Goldilocks felt downright drowsy. She had always told her mother that she didn't need a nap, but just now, Goldilocks would not protest a rest. So, she climbed the stairs, found the bear's bedroom, and pulled herself up onto the first bed, which was really big. Too high, worried Goldilocks, peering over the edge. And the sheets don't even match. She let herself down, pulling the pillow with her, and walked to the middle bed, which was sort of big, but not as tall as the first. She tried that one. No way, she complained. This is like lying on jello. Then she tried the third bed, which wasn't big at all. Goldilocks pronounced the little bear's bed just right. It was so comfortable, in fact, that in no time at all, she slipped sleepily into slumberland. Pretty soon, the three bears came back from their walk. The papa bear promptly saw the spoon in his really big bowl of porridge. Someone's been eating my porridge, he scowled. Just then, the mama bear noticed that her spoon was in the bowl that was soda big. My goodness, she fretted, someone's been eating my porridge too. They both turned to see the baby bear staring teary-eyed at his bowl, which wasn't big at all, but was completely empty. Someone's been eating my porridge, and there's none left for me. The papa bear was puzzled. He needed to think. He went to sit down in his really big chair, but he noticed that his favorite cushion had been moved. Someone's been sitting in my chair, he grumbled. The mama bear turned and saw that the cushion on her chair, which was sort of big but not really that big, was nearly folding in half. Someone's been sitting in my chair, too, she groused. They turned to see the baby bear crying over a pile of wood chips. Someone's been sitting in my chair, and it's all smashed to pieces. By now, the papa bear began to sniff around for the intruder. Cautiously, he climbed the stairs to the bedroom. There, he spied his pillow on the floor next to the really big bed. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, he growled. The mama bear was mighty concerned when she saw the quilt all crumpled up on a bed, which was sort of big but not as tall as papa bear's bed. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, too, she moaned. They turned to see the baby bear with his mouth agape pointing at his bed, which wasn't big at all. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, and she's still there. Sure enough, there was Goldilocks curled up on the little bed like a tuckered-out terrier. The papa bear let out a low, rumbling growl that shook all three beds. Goldilocks awoke and rubbed her eyes. 
She saw the three bears glare at her and she shrieked, Bears! Now the three bears were well aware that there were bears. No one needed to tell them. But before they could question her, Goldilocks bolted from the little bear's bed and hopped out the window right into a tree. She slid down that tree so fast she left skid marks and she ran all the way home. Let me tell you, from that day on, Goldilocks stopped being stubborn, I'd like another teddy bear, please. traded in her tricks, and did exactly what her parents told her. The three bears, I must mention, put a lock on their door. They never knew what a favor they had done for Goldilocks. In fact, they never saw her again. And I can't say that made them sad.